Guess where we are? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We are walking through 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We've only been in it for a week or so. I will tell you that after, after this service, assuming that I get done with where I think I'm going, um, that we're going to take broader sections, uh, and which means more than one verse on a Sunday. Uh, but I, th- I think the, the truths in these passages are uh, so apparently uh, applicable that we need to take time to unpack that. And there's a reason to cover a broader section here in just a moment. We will. Uh, but we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 3 through 6. And while we've been walking through this, it's sometimes difficult. You know, you, you're looking at a forest or you're looking at a tree. Sometimes it depends on your perspective. And we've been, we've tried to look at the forest by reading the passages, reading the verses, and, and trying to get context. But then we come up to the tree of the application of these passages, and they're pretty, pretty tight to um, what God wants us to do in standing uh, on the Word of God and how we deal with false doctrine, both uh, outside the church and in the church, and how we walk through this life personally in making the decisions we make. So there's been a lot of application. Uh, and verse 6 is really, I think, the period at the end of that first doctrinal set. So this is spiritual warfare, and as we set the stage, really this title has one word, and it's obedience, and I already know that messages like this tend to be quiet messages, because you're talking about, for many people, what is often considered to be a hard thing, and I respect that, but I also want to encourage you that God does give us a path to living victoriously in Christ. And it's not just personally, but it's also true for the church. There's a path for how to do spiritual battle. And so we're walking through that path. So what I want to do is I want to pray, and then we'll read 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 together. And we'll look largely at verse 6. Now, it's probably not fair for me to do, but I think I'm going to take you to another passage right away. And it's in Romans, and it's chapter 13, excuse me, chapter 15, chapter 15 and verse 13. And really, I'm just going to kind of have a a pastoral introduction to you. So you heard in the prayers, that it's uh, it's, uh, something that I recognize that many times Christians get into this place, and I don't know how you're coming to the service today. Um, you, You know of anybody with issues? Do you know of anybody with issues? Sometimes it's easy to think of other people that have them. I wonder if anybody that knows you and thinks you have issues. (laughs) I think we all do. um, But I really want God to meet you where you are. And I want to encourage you. Uh, I really find encouragement over Romans 15, 13. It's not in the message. It's just on my heart. It says, would you read that verse out loud with me? Romans 15 and verse 13. Read it out loud. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. When you read about that, uh, you may uh, be filled with all joy and peace in believing. It's not just believing the, the general truth about God and goodness. It really is anchored in the gospel. We have hope because of the gospel. You know what the gospel tells us? When you know Jesus, it's going to be okay. Right? When you know Jesus, it's going to be okay. And the invitation of the gospel for everybody here is if you don't know him, uh, you should. Because he's the answer to your soul's need. And there is no greater need that represents itself in your life than the need of your soul. It's more important than your finances, your house, your car, your refrigerator that broke or your dishwasher is not working. And some of you are saying, you may be saying those as illustrations, but every one of those broke this week in your family. I don't know. But more important than all those things is the need of your soul. And you can live a life searching and looking and looking and searching and coming up empty and feeling like you're living a life of vanity one day after the other. 
And I want to tell you, the hope of the world is the gospel through Christ, that he can meet your need where you are. And I'm just, as a testimony, I want to say, I thank the Lord that one of the experiences, I had two major experiences <clears throat> in emotion that I felt when I came to Christ, I felt like I had a father who would never leave me nor forsake me. And that sense of, of um, being enveloped by the father was a big deal for me. The second thing in common to many Christians' experience is that sense of that black void being filled with the person of God. And just as a testimony, never regretted one day of giving my life to Christ. And if you can say amen to that yourself, say amen. amen. So I, I hope that you would come to know him. But believer, I want to encourage you, and, and, and this is a statement I make a lot of times to people in different situations. If you are discouraged and lacking hope, now I know this is be a bit rebuking to say, but please hear me. If, if you're discouraged and lacking hope, your eyes are on the wrong thing. More directly, your eyes are not on God. And I understand how that can be. Life can be loud. There can be dynamic situations going on, screaming in your face. But I want to remind you that God will give you hope because that's who he is. It says in this verse, now the God of hope. So if you're going to find hope anywhere, it's going to be in him. Now I would couple these verses or this verse with Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. And that's the God. Now it's God. There's a perfect peace when your mind gets fixed on God. And it goes on to say, because he trusts in thee. And it says, the reason for trusting the Lord, trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah, I often think of that name as God's power name, his mighty name, so that you can have confidence in his name is everlasting strength. So God wants to help you, but here's the thing. Many times we want God to do for us what God wants us to do ourselves. God has given you everything that you need to be godly in Christ if you know him as your savior. You're not missing a secret recipe. You're not missing uh, that book for 1999. You're not missing that hanky that's been blessed by the televangelist. Um, I've been thinking about getting a gold suit. Anyway, so <clears throat> you're not missing something. <laughs> you're going to be distracted with that sight and you're uh, you know, kill that sight right now. Um, you have what you need when you come to know Christ because the Holy Spirit indwells you. He's given you the authority of his word. But many times we pray, and, and, and this is so dicey to say, we pray prayers that I can understand but aren't necessarily great in doctrine. And, and, and I don't, I, you can argue this, don't get me wrong, so don't, don't, don't throw stones at what I'm about to say. Sometimes we're praying for God to help us and he already has. We'll say, Lord, help me to stop or help me to, and he already has. He's told you, he's led you, he's made you aware, but now there comes that point of personal choice and responsibility. You ever wished you could step in somebody else's life and make them do right? Can you think of anybody that's got situations that if you could just step in and make that decision for them, it would fix their situation? I mean, that's an honest assessment. If you could step in their life and make that decision for them, then it would fix the problem they have. But you can't make decisions for somebody else. And there is the crux of the matter that nobody can make decisions for you. Now, when we come to this, let's read verses three through six of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll see the target of this. And we're gonna be reading large passages of scripture, I'll tell you already. But 2 Timothy, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 Verse 3, reading through verse 6, if you would read out loud with me. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled." We need to be mindful of this as we step into verse 6. And I do, uh, if I can take a parenthetical before I give you verse 6. In my life, there have been messages that have been like, those messages are big in my memory and big in my history because they have been what God has used really heavily in my life. So I'm going to tell you now, if you're visiting or new to the service, it's the last message I preached on 2 Corinthians 10.5 that was hugely instrumental in my life. And I encourage you, to, not because it's my words, but because of the truth that was shared. That is life-changing stuff, 2 Corinthians 10.5. But as we come to verse 6, I want to remind us that this is a continuance of the weapons of our warfare for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the, to the what effect? To the pulling down of strongholds. So I'm going to remind you the hope that God is, that God is more powerful than any power on the planet. He's more powerful than any uh, government, more powerful than any individual, and more powerful than any circumstance going on. And you need to take comfort in knowing that. Now, is there a lot going on in the world that you could be worried about? Sure. Uh, should we be paying attention to what's going on with Israel? Sure. But who's got that under control? God. Do the governments have that under control? Absolutely not. And I want to tell you, you know, if you look at what man has done to Israel in its history, there should not be an Israel at all. But there is. Why? Because God has a plan. And that's the nature of God's power. And I think you see God's power right now. And it, I mean, there are times, you know, as we look back in history, it was mentioned, you know, World War I and World War II and all the wars and, and talking about our veterans. You know, if we were living back in the, that time of history, we would have absolutely believed that that was the end. And that it would have been the annihilation of, of the Jewish people. But God but God does what God does. So what do you do? You have to know that there is always hope when your eyes are on God. Now, it's one thing to know that politically. It's another thing to know that personally. And in your life, I want you to know the power of God in your life to help you. But I also want to remind you that many people don't experience the power of God in their lives over particular sin or particular battle because they are warring the wrong way. And I can only, as a friend and pastor and preacher, tell you the right way, which are not my ways and not my words, but God's. And I can speak with all authority on that. I have absolute confidence that what I'm sharing with you is not a spin on the word of God, but by comparing scripture with scripture, what I'm sharing with you is consistent to the word of God. But many believers don't experience victory because you keep warring after the flesh. You keep handling things your way. As we come to verse 6, this is part of the spiritual warfare. Now, we've looked at uh, other passages regarding this, the weapons of our warfare. We've looked at this, the nature of your mind. Does your mind matter in the battle? Yes. Um, your mind, if it's not right... Uh, will not do well in spiritual warfare. Now, let me ask you, how easily is your mind messed up? How easily is your mind messed up? Another question is, how frequently is your mind messed up? And this is the nature, I think, of what the Scripture teaches. Our minds need to be continually made new. Our minds continually need cleansing and re-altered or altered. But as we come into verse 6, this spiritual warfare that we come to, there are three things in this that I'm going to use and then go to other passages to underscore it. 
Part of spiritual warfare is making a decision in your life about your own obedience to Christ. And the disposition that the church has to have in standing against evil, and I think it's important to remember that the context really is in the church. Second Corinthians chapter 10, he's talking about what's happening in the church. It has application outside, has application to the individual, but he's talking about trouble that's happening in the church. There, there are times as believers, well, not just times, there is a disposition that you and I need to have. And it's in this first few words and having in a readiness, having in a readiness, you and I as Christians need to understand that our spiritual warfare can't be a time in and time out and do well, can't be a check in and check out, do well and do well with our walk with God. If you want to walk with the Lord well, you need to have a readiness, a preparedness all the time in your obedience to Christ. Now, when it says having in a readiness, it gives really strong language in that which follows. But the idea is being on your toes spiritually. That you are looking at what's in front of you. You're aware of the spiritual circumstances in your life and in your world. And you're ready and on your toes as a believer to stand where you need to stand. Now, uh, I just want to challenge everybody in this room that we all need to be on our toes spiritually. We all need to be in that spirit of readiness, but that readiness has a target and it comes very quickly. A readiness in this very interesting way of saying this, to revenge all disobedience. Now, I I don't have no other phrase in the Bible that's used in just this way. To revenge all disobedience. What does it mean to revenge? It also is translated elsewhere, has the idea of avenging something. It's when there has been a wrong and we are stepping in with, uh, with zeal to make it right. So to avenge something is to step up when there has been a wrong and you're going to make it right. So my, my daughter Lydia was, uh, I don't know how old, she, these, this is preteen years and she and Katie Best are uh, playing out in the snow and, and some boys in the subdivision uh, decided they want to have a snowball fight with these girls. And they're about the same age. And, and then one of the boys comes over and he's, and, and he's, he's being all sneaky and, and whatnot. But he, he, he's, he starts to steal their snowballs. And my Lydia tries to stop him. Long story short here, at some point this boy punches my Lydia. And I think he punched her in the face. Now... Katie Best was with Lydia at the moment. And our family has grown up with the Bests, and these are kids who are like brothers and sisters in our family. And as soon as he hit Lydia, Katie was on the other side. Katie vaulted over Lydia, pounced on this kid's chest, and began to be vehement with desire. Boom. Glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Glory, hallelujah. Pounding this kid in the face, and he gets up bleeding and crying. Amen. <laughs> and this is to avenge. To avenge his disobedience was to say, it is time to step up. It is time to come to the plate I'm not going to stand by as a pacifist on truth. I'm not going to stand by and watch lies and untruths win the day. Somebody's got to step up and tell the truth. Somebody's got to step up and stand for the truth. Now, that application is all over the place. Yes, it's to the error that's in the world. Somebody has got to stand up and tell the truth when all the world wants to believe a lie. Somebody's got to step up and and sound the truth when error is happening in the church and people are behaving carnally and tearing down the name of Christ over issues. Somebody has to make a decision to stand for the truth. Somebody in their life has to make a decision to stand for the truth instead of believing lies about your own sin and your own disobedience. And at some point... You have to decide 
to take a stand. Otherwise, you forever do exactly what you despise that is so uh, prevalent all over modern day society and you live a snowflake victim life. If only you don't understand, if you only knew, you would know why it's right for me to be disobedient, and it's not. If you just understood uh, what was going on, you you would say, hey, it's okay, I, I, I know that God says this, but. At some point, people have to love the Lord and love people enough to tell the truth and stand on the truth no matter what the world around you does. But yes, while it has application in the world, has application in the church, it has application for you. And this revenging or avenging disobedience, it has the idea of doing justice upon, that justice and that which is right would come to the situation. And many times, so I've asked this question, I I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Are people stubborn? On a scale of zero to 10, how stubborn can we be? You probably have a person, you're looking, you see them. You see that person. But given the right circumstance, how stubborn can you be? Are your heels dug in on some issues that you're just not willing to do the right thing? There is opposition to the truth, and it can come from outside, but it can come right there in your seat. Now, what's what's the real uh, fundamental sense of what he's talking about? Avenging or revenging, that bringing justice upon... Let's read verse 6 again. Having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We'll come to that second part in just a moment. But it really has what's coming up in 2 Corinthians 11. And it's been here all along. It's in 1 Corinthians as well. There's disobedience in the church and the effect of that disobedience. Uh, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase or take snippets of verse 4 of 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4. But here's the idea. There was preaching of another Jesus whom they had not preached, who Paul had not preached. There was a receiving of another spirit, which they had not received, or another gospel, which they had not accepted. There was a receiving of those things. And there was a tolerance within the church of Corinth over things that should not be tolerated. Now, while that's true of others around you, I'm telling you that many Christians live defeated lives spiritually because they are tolerating in their lives things that should not be tolerated. <clears throat> and you will stay broken and you will stay trapped where you are until you make a decision about obedience. Now, we talked about this recently. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Okay? Now, so deviant are we that we will give a mental assent to what God has said or even a half-hearted attempt at what God has said and then find ourselves broken and, and still living in the same chains. And we have, have the audacity to turn back to God and say, see, you failed me. Or maybe not so aggressively, we would say it more passively, it didn't work. As if God didn't do for you what would make you victorious. Now, I'm going to tell you, without exception, when those things are said, it really comes back to this. There is in that life still and yet persisting a blatant disobedience. And yet expecting that they're going to have victory while remaining disobedient. It's not going to happen. You might jump from one problem to the next, from from one thing to the next, but your life will stay broken until you come to the last part of this and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When you complete obedience in your life. Now, this message needs to be driven to the heart of each individual in this room. 
God is your God, I'm not God, and, and God's working in my life as well, but God needs to have his will and way in your heart. We've come to this place today to worship him in spirit and in truth, and I can tell you that right now, sometimes people come through the doors with a wall up already. You can, I, I will come to worship God, but I'm not going to do what he says. How do you expect you're going to leave this place? So I am for you, and I want to help you, but you have to make choices for yourself. Take your Bibles to John chapter 14 for a moment. When it says your obedience is fulfilled, listen, there are a lot of people that uh, think that somehow they're going to get to heaven doing their, doing their thing. You're not going to get to heaven any way but through Christ. There is no way to come to heaven's doors and be granted entrance into heaven without coming to know Christ personally. So you must make a decision to be obedient to Jesus and the gospel. But believers, when you've done that, John 14, 15 through 21, I'm not going to read all those verses. I'm going to read really just verse 15 and 21. You read verse 15 out loud with me. Verse 15 of John 14, what does it say? If you love me, keep my commandments. No. Don't want to. Have you ever told God no? Maybe not out and out, but you still disobeyed him. Every hand in this room would be up. You ever disobeyed God? Yes. Now, we start getting really nitpicky. What about today? What about yesterday? What about where you are right now? Read verse 21. Out loud with me, verse 21, same passage, John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. What is, the t what is the definition of a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What's the word that we often use? One word, follower, okay? So what is a follower? A follower is someone who leads where, or who goes where they are led that they actually take the steps where they're being led towards. It has the idea of putting your foot behind someone and actually doing what they say. Now, it's important to remember that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is militaristic language. It's spiritual warfare. And so you have a lot of illustration in the Bible about being a soldier of Christ, about making decisions as a soldier of Christ, how to war a good warfare. <clears throat> but it comes down to every good soldier at some point has to make a decision to follow orders and to do what's commanded. We've talked about that in previous messages, but I'm going to take your Bibles now to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And we recognize this this morning. Now, again, I often am prone to say this is not rocket science. But we make it really complicated. First Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15, we're reading about Saul, and we're picking up 10 verses in in this passage. Now, what was the command of God to Saul? It was to wipe out a disobedient nation, a disobedient people, and who are they? The Amalekites. And in this passage, it was told to not take any of this stuff, not to save anything. God's wrath was being poured about, out upon a disobedient uh, and, and righteous judgment upon the Amalekites. And he was using his people to do so. The word comes to Samuel in verse 10 saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Why? He's made this decision in his life. He has turned back from what we would call being a disciple of God a follower of God, he's turned back from following me. And this is very specific. He has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, he cried to the Lord all night, and he rose early to meet Saul in the morning. Verse 12, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and has gone about and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. Anybody else ever in your own life know those times when you put on a good game face? Now, I'm really talking about you 
because it's too easy to look at somebody else. Where we put on this pretense of everything is good, and not just everything's good, but I am right with God. Blessed be thou of the Lord. And listen to what he says. Listen to how specific he is. Without being asked, he says, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now, I want to ask you something. Do you think Saul already knows? You ever heard the phrase, you protest too much? Or you you kind of put forth. And uh, here we are without Samuel saying anything and Saul is already saying, look, I have done exactly what God wants me to say. I want to tell you something, folks. Now, I I am blessed to be a pastor. I'm blessed to listen to people. I'm blessed to try to help people. But I cannot tell you how many times I have people telling me how godly they are while they're disobeying God outright. And it's not a secret. I want to let you know something. I love you and I'm, I'm going to listen to you and I'm not, I'm not your judge. But I, I am telling you, I already also know something about you that you may not be willing to admit out loud, but I know that you already know where there is rebellion against God. Because the Holy Spirit is a lot more powerful than any human being and he's already working in your heart. Well, he says, I've done what God wanted me to do. Samuel said, you got to love the question. Verse 14, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the ox in which I hear? What is all this noise if you've wiped out all that God said to wipe out? Saul said, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Israel. He's talking about, he's talking about the Jews. He's talking about those that he led. He's, he's saying the people did this. They have brought them from the Amalekites. Oh, we're going to put a good spin on this. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen, all for good purposes, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Can you get any more spiritually? Can you twist this any more? Samuel said unto Saul, stay. Now, what's what's the modern equivalent of stay? What is the modern equivalent of stay? Now, you can say be quiet. You can say don't talk. I think, the, I think we're, we're hedging. <laughs> don't you tell me, shut up. <laughs> right? <laughs> stay. And I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. He said unto him, say on as if Samuel needed his permission. I appreciate this. This is revenging disobedience. Sometimes you're going to step forward and you're going to stand on the truth, whether or not somebody really wants to hear it. And you don't do it because you're angry. You don't do it because you're hateful. You actually do it because you love God and you love his people. And you want God's best for them. He's going to lay it out here in verse 17. Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed thee king over Israel. You remember, you remember when Saul was chosen? What did he do? You remember he hid. He hid amongst the stuff. The Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Malachites, verse 18, and the fight and fight against them until they be consumed. The question, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Was it a mystery, the directive that God had given? Was it hard to understand? Would we call it black and white? Saul said unto Samuel, yea, listen to his persistence, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, 
The chief of the things which should have been, and there it is, you, he knows it already, which should have been utterly destroyed, and he still puts the spin on, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Read verse 22 out loud with me. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? That's his, that's his question. You can finish it with me. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. I'm going to go on here, and it gets very direct. Rebellion is as the sin of, next word. So is there any, is there any uh, kind of polish and veneer we're going to put on this that makes it acceptable now to God? He says, and stubbornness is as iniquity, which we know to be sin. And particularly, he names idolatry. So rebellion and stubbornness, that's what God sees. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people. And here he had the choice. And obeyed their voice. He did what the people wanted him to do because he wanted to be either liked by the people or he didn't want to hear the wrath of the people or he didn't want to have to stand against the people. And I'm looking out against a group of people this morning that God wants you to stand on his truth in this world around you, not hatefully, not vindictively, not out of a heart of, of wrath, but to stand loving God and loving people enough to tell them the truth. And he says in verse 25, I pray thee pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said, Saul, I will not return with thee for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. You have made a decision. And there is a consequence of that decision. The Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. Take your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 11. All right, so here we are reading heavy, heavy stuff because um, now sometimes people say, well, Pastor Jeff, are you preaching to me? Because it sort of seems like that message is for me. Almost like you're going to be offended that I'm preaching to you. I want to tell you something. I am preaching to you. <laughs> and I'm preaching to you because I love you and I care about you. But in, in history, I've had people say things about doing what God wants to do. And I, I, I think on these things and try to think, how can I help God's people with this? But there are times where I will have people say, Pastor Jeff, I want to do the right thing, but it's so hard. Now, I don't know what you would do to counsel that. But my statement on that, when someone tells me doing the right thing is hard, the sentiment that I want to give back to them is, you really don't know how hard sin can be. You really don't know how hard it can be choosing to live outside of God. You've heard me use language like this a lot. Satan is described as a roaring lion. And because of that language, this is, this is kind of what I have even said this week, is that Satan will chew you up and spit you out. I remember I was talking to my wife or talking to somebody else, but I said, I said specifically, Satan's been chewing on people. And there's a righteous anger in that to see that God's people are just being chewed on. But sometimes then I will hear this blackness of no hope and no way out. And, no, and, and when you start believing that, again, your eyes aren't on God. And you're not warring a spiritual warfare. You're warring after the flesh because God is a God of hope. And God does give you all you need to do the right thing. All you need. But you... Sitting where you are, you have a choice to make that nobody can make for you. Listen, we have prayer cards on our table that are graduation cards, that are Christmas cards. They get in our stack of prayer cards. 
And we pray through those at supper time. We usually try to pray for at least two. And as we cycle through those, there have been people who have come through our church, raised in our church and out living on their own and, and now adults and doing their thing. And very often I'm praying that God will get a, a hold of their hearts and bring them back to him. Why? And some of them are related to you right here in this room. Why? Because they are making choices for themselves. Nobody can make those choices for them. But here in this room, God, in his sovereign plan, has given you all the power you need from him, but he's also giving you the power of choice yourself. What will you decide? Will you make a decision that you've had enough of the effect of disobedience in your life and you're ready to take vengeance upon that disobedience? How bad does it have to get before you finally say, I'm tired of trying to make happiness out of my way and I finally will surrender to God? Now, here's the big lie. We get this idea that somehow surrendering to God is a bad thing. I don't get it, folks. I don't get it. The only bad that I see in my life are the bad things that I've done, the bad choices I've made, the bad decisions I make. I have never once in my life seen God be bad. Somehow there's this lie that if I give my life to God, if I do what he wants, he'll mess up my life. Who are you believing at that point? Who are you listening to at that point? And these are people who know and testify that Jesus is their savior. Who are you listening to? Jeremiah chapter 11. This should be two messages, but here we are. Jeremiah 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, and this is rebuke against Judah. There's all kinds of incredible truth here, but he says, hear ye the words of this covenant. And speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You're in Jeremiah 11, verse 3. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. Now, this is all illustration. We're not Israel. We're not Jews. But this is God who had told his people what to do, and they didn't. And you're seeing the disposition of God and the truth of God standing against lies. So he says, they obey not the words of this covenant, verse 4, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you, so shall, be my peop so shall you be my people and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is this day. Then answered I and said, so be it, O Lord. Then the Lord said unto me, Proclaim all these words. You're just the messenger. Proclaim these words in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear ye the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Three words. Obey my voice. Yet they obeyed not. And the disposition of heart is here, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination, that ought to sound like 2 Corinthians 10, 5, every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I have commanded them to do, but they did them not. And the Lord said unto me, a conspiracy is found among the men of Judah. And among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, they are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. You hear the choices? And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I, have, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord in verse 11, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, go and cry unto the gods unto whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in the time of their trouble. Why? Because they're not gods at all. Verse 13. For according, listen to how many gods they worship. For according to the numbers of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah. 
According to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, have you set up altars to that shameful thing, even altars to burn incense unto Baal? Therefore pray not thou for this people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. What hath my beloved to do in mine house, seeing she hath wrought lewdness with many? And the holy flesh is passed from thee. When thou doest evil, then thou rejoicest. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of a goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it. And the branches of it are broken. Verse 17, for the Lord of hosts that planted thee hath pronounced evil against thee. For the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense unto Baal. For a moment. Chapter 25, verses 4 through 7. And the Lord sent unto you what was his kindness to Israel, what was his kindness to Judah, what was his kindness to his people. He sent you all his servants, the prophets, in verse 4. Jeremiah 25, verse 4. He sent you all his pro servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to them. They said, Turn ye again now every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever and go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will do you no hurt. Ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your own hands, or hands to your own hurt. Take your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. If you want uh, further study, you need to read Jeremiah chapter 7, which we're not doing. See? See how much time I'm saving? You should read Jeremiah 7. Luke chapter 6. And why call ye, verse 46. I love it when I hear those pages turning. Because I get to drink my coffee. <laughs> Luke 6, 46. Why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I just read it for you. Everybody read it together out loud. Luke 6, 46. Read it out loud, please. And why call ye me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? In silence and let it rest. Let it cook. Let it come home. Verse 47, I'll read through verse 49. Whomsoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built his built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently upon the house, that house, and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. Because he did God's truth. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was what? Mild? No big deal? No, it was great. Now, this is true in the gospel. And we know this, uh, that most of these truths are very centered in the gospel. So you can take any number of passages about the gospel and the gospel is very clear you know it, and you can help me memorize or say it. I, I'll, I'll see how I do here. John three sixteen through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You will not disobey God regarding the gospel and be in heaven. You will not disobey God regarding the gospel and be saved. You 
have to surrender and obey him. But believer, this spiritual warfare is true of the battles in your life as well. So sometimes, and I often use marriage because frankly I know that there's, according to the word on the street, sometimes conflict in marriage. I know it's rare. I, I, it may not be true, but I've heard it said. And I'm, I'm telling you that people can live their whole married lives broken because they won't obey God. And you'll have a husband who will justify his coldness, his silence, his withdrawal because of that woman. And you'll have a woman that will justify her bitterness and her deep-seated resentment and continual exhibited resistance and stubbornness towards her husband because of that man. And here's what I want to say to you. Obey God. You want to have a good marriage? Obey God. Here you have Jeff as your friend telling you again, this is not rocket science. But many couples have justified their antagonism one toward another in their marriage and you're going to wake up the same way tomorrow that you are today if you don't make a different choice. And that choice is not to be a better person. That choice, is, I'm, I'm not even offering to sell you anything. And I'm telling you, I'm glad to visit with you. I'm glad to, I'm glad to help you. But you don't even need to meet in my office. All you have to do is love God and do what he says. And you say, Pastor Jeff, you make that sound so simple. Yeah, I guess I do. You know what's complex? Living the life and playing the games of animosity. That's what's complex. It, it's dirt nasty. And it isn't worth it. Now, I've said husbands and wives, but this is all of us one towards another. There are people living their lives in church this way. I don't like that person in church and I avoid that person in church. <laughs> Believe it or not, I've had a time or two where people have been mad at me. I've had, I've had it happen where I got the sense that somebody was avoiding me. And so I tried to break through and I found them. And it was everything I could do to get in front of them to make them look at me. And then when I did, it was kind of verified there was a problem. And right back here in this office, I had that person tell me, the Bible doesn't say we have to be best friends. I'm like, over what? Over what? It's really not hard. Do we love God? Hello. Hello. If we do, we're going to purpose to love each other. Amen. Thank you. And that means that we're going to purpose to make the right choice. To love God, love each other. And if the love of God is going to live anywhere on the planet, it should be living in your home and in this place. But folks, don't stay broken. Now, I, I, again, I've just thrown a rock over the, uh, the pond of illustration and I've given you this one area, but it doesn't really matter what it is. Whatever sin issue, whatever it is that gets, and, and by the way, it, it may not even be there today, it could be there tomorrow, but the answer is the same. Love God enough to do the right thing. Love God enough to obey him. And you'll find that these truths are not written in a corner. They're all over the pages of scripture. And it isn't simply about 
authoritarianism. This is a God who loves you and wants to walk in relationship with you for your good. Every ounce of good you're going to find is in him. And here is God in his word saying, let's fulfill obedience in our lives. Let's complete and bring to the period at the end of the sentence of whatever issue it is, God, here's what we're going to do. I am going to obey you. That's the choice.